appreciate it. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Sylvia Grundmann, and the first thing I would like to do is, as we are a very exclusive uh, group, may I ask you to come a bit up front, because then, especially the people in the back, don't be shy, uh, we can have a more um, yeah, private discussion, and everybody will have the possibility to ask, to make also statements, if they are not too long, um, so I'm looking forward to our discussions here. Um, I am a German national and I'm honored to be with you here in the Kirchhof Saal, as Kirchhof was a scholar from Itzehoe. Itzehoe is a very small place in Schleswig-Holstein, um, about 70 kilometers up north from Hamburg. And I come from an even smaller place, about 100 kilometers uh, from Hamburg, where there's nothing but cows and sheep. Um, and from that place, I went to Hamburg, studied law, and currently I'm working in Strasbourg for the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe, 47 member states, so pan-European intergovernmental organization and the Council of Europe has values to protect. Freedom of expression is among them as it is a cornerstone stone for democracy. We also protect the rule of law and human rights. And um, our panel today will about building audiences and promoting values. One value we have always promoted at the Council of Europe is public service media. So that's our common denominator here for our panel and our panelists. They are all with public service media. Public service media, we have an important umbrella organization. Umbrellas are much needed in Hamburg. You saw it last night. Today it's a beautiful day. And our umbrella person from EBU is Jean-Philippe Detende. Jean-Philippe has an impressive track record as a content producer for TV over many years. And since 2015, he has moved to EBU and he will now give a short statement uh, his view on things as to building audiences and promoting values. Okay, good morning everybody. Thanks for uh, the invitation for uh, being here on, uh, on, on this panel. Uh, when we talk values, uh, values are core to public service media. The EBU has more than 70 members across 50 countries and they have all signed off on a common set of values, which is universality, independence, diversity, innovation, quality, and accountability. And two of them, I would say, universality and independence, are core to public service media, but also core to news. Universality meaning that you want to reach out to everybody. Everybody in the audience is entitled to have a trusted news source. But also, and that's becoming more and more independent in a global world today, it needs to be independent meaning that the news you bring has to be away from any economic, commercial or uh, political uh, uh, value. So that's why I would say that public service media is more than ever important in um, a changing global world. However, um, uh, being the most trusted uh, source or aiming to be the most uh, trusted source um, is not always recognized. And I think that public service media today is facing to big challenges. The one is that it has to redefine what it does uh, in this changing world. And the second one is that it needs to reposition itself because clearly trust it has become a big issue with regard to, uh, to news. When I mean redefine uh, what we do, uh, that is quite simple because I, I used to be a TV person, worked in radio as well, but the business we are in today is not the TV business or the radio business. We are in a content business and our content needs to get out. You know, it, it needs to get across to the audiences 
and we can use platforms and brands uh, in between. But that's a total redefinition of what is of what is happening. And the cause of this is that we have more and more players today at stake, very big players, the tech giants, uh, uh, as we call them, GAFA, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and, and Apple, but who today, you know, uh, want to take up the role or take up the role of content producers uh, itself. This means that the way we have worked in the past is not the way we can work today, the way we gather news, the way we produce it, the sort of storytelling we do, the distributions we foresee um, are totally uh, different. And to give you just one example, in the past when there was breaking news, you would have a journalist going on the spot and then the reporting would start. That's no longer the case today because you have citizens being there, they have social media and they start I'm not going to say reporting, but sharing what is happening immediately and on the spot. And what we see is that uh, this news in between brackets uh, hits the audiences even before official news gathering uh, starts. Um, one of the things, just to give you one example that we are doing in the EBU is a UGC verification, is a, a clearing a content that is coming uh, from uh, social media and um, uh, spread it amongst our members. And this is important to give you just a recent case when there were the London attacks, even before the BBC was present, there were images online. So what the EBU does in its own newsroom in Geneva is to find this content, check the source of, uh, of the content, uh, reach out to the person who uh, has produced the content and then clear this. This is important because this is the first source that people get today. Another important thing is that uh, in the case of breaking news, more and more we need to explain what has been confirmed as a fact and what as up to now is a rumor. Because with social media a lot of rumors spread, you know, and we need to debunk all of the rumors that are not true unless they are uh, fully confirmed. This is a change that is happening in the entire industry and which is not exclusive for uh, public service media and where all of the media outlets are trying to redefine what, uh, what they are doing. Uh, a very good example is, as well as the, is the New York Times who, uh, where in the past the newspaper would be your, one of your prime sources, has now to play a, a different role in the formats they bring and in the news uh, they bring. The biggest challenge I would uh, say we face today is uh, reposition public service media as the most trusted news source. One of the big challenges I see is that we live in the what I call the 5149 paradigm in a world that is polarized. When you look at Brexit, 51% voted for, 49% voted against. Uh, it was a similar uh, polarization in the uh, US elections. What you see today is that news is being polarized as well. Take the example of the United States. You have Fox on the one side, you have CNN and the New York Times on the other side. And the problem is that they reach out to half of the audience. Uh, Fox is reaching out to the, uh, with a popular voice, CNN and the New York Times are reaching out to people like all of us who are educated, who are interested in, in news. I think it is the role of public service media to, out, to be there for 100% of the, of the audience, which means that today we need to find new ways, new formats, new ways of storytelling to reaching out to, uh, to everybody. Uh, I have a very good example of uh, NOS in the Netherlands, uh, who together with 15 of our other members are in what we call a youth news exchange. It's a daily news bulletin for uh, kids, for the youngsters. What we see today is that it's very popular with the adults as well, proving that a lot of adults, you know, don't understand what you tell in the main news bulletin. They don't understand what is written in The Economist. So it is the role of public service media to re redefine this and to uh, find news of, uh, of doing so. Uh, to be fully honest, I say we are the most trusted uh, uh, news source because we have signed up for a set of, uh, uh, of values. If I'm fully honest, then I'm, then I'm going to say that we have some members that well who are very much under pressure by their government governments. You see a number of public broadcasters who are very well funded by their governments, but there is some, somehow a condition that goes with it, is that they report on the official line that is uh, uh, done by the government. Uh, uh, these members are under pressure. I think we need to have a conversation with them. Uh, we don't need to kick them out. On the contrary, we need to put pressure on these territories. 
um, Poland, Turkey, Hungary, uh, where you have uh, the populist uh, uh, ruling, um, uh, to have these public broadcasters be really uh, uh, independent. And two more small points and then I, then I hand over. I think fake news has been a topic that has been discussed a lot over here. It was said yesterday, fake news has been around uh, since a very long time. That is true. But never uh, was it so easy to spread fake news. Uh, we had uh, citizen journalism 10 years ago, which was popular. Now citizens are paid to, in certain territories to produce fake news to set a certain uh, agenda because there is a, a business model. The EBU and some of our members, we have been approached by Facebook saying, well, uh, we have a problem. Uh, you are a trusted news source. Uh, you have uh, uh, legacy journalists and legacy newsrooms. Could you help us uh, sort this uh, out? Um, I'm not quite convinced if we uh, should do that because the problem of fake news is not the, the, the problem of uh, traditional news media. It's the problem of Facebook and have a very easy solution to solve the problem. It's to push in their algorithm the news that comes from trusted news sources on top so that people, whatever they uh, search for, that they get these trusted uh, 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 news sources. And the strange thing with Facebook is that they, are, they have very good PR agencies. You know, they spin around the problem. There's a problem out, out there. And they now seem to be the ones that are going to solve the problem. They said, look, look at this Facebook, you know, there's a problem over there, we're going to, uh, to solve it. Uh, uh, and then the last thing um, that is very important and more and more important is media literacy and more specifically news literacy. Uh, public service media should be the most trusted news source without any doubt, but we also need to guide our audiences to what other trusted news sources are. And we need to help them to define, you know, um, uh, how they can figure out what is a trusted news source and not. So I think that um, um, launching initiative with uh, schools and, and academics uh, to have a specific toolbox on, uh, on news literacy is, um, is an important thing. And to close, um, I think uh, uh, quality journalism, as we call it, is, uh, is very important because I think it's uh, uh, fundamental to a, um, a good working uh, uh, democracy. Uh, EBU has been very prominent in the exchange of news and in advocating news. We're going to launch uh, later this year a product which we call quality journalism exactly to tackle some of these uh, uh, problems. And apart from being a good trusted news source, also be much more the advocate for uh, independent news. Uh, see that we have the, f the right resources. Uh, talk with these uh, tech giants and to see if we can have uh, partnerships uh, where we better promote uh, ourselves. And go out, reach out to schools and academics and with the good practices we have, have the youngsters you know, learn uh, how they have to uh, have access to good uh, uh, news sources. So a brief introduction and uh, uh, a lot of topics of uh, what is important in the value side and building audiences. Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe. I think this is a wonderful scene setting, uh, bringing in all the aspects that we want to discuss from a public service media angle. And I would like to move now to a young public service media, actually to Susanna Hanselova from Slovakia, who is the anchor there for the radio and television of Slovakia. Dobry dzień. Dobry dzień. And um, I wonder, Jean-Philippe has stressed an important point, namely to establish trust and credibility. And knowing a little bit the history of Slovakia, where we had state TV, I wonder whether maybe Susanna can share her experience with us especially when it comes to building trust and credibility. Uh, hello, thank you for having me in the panel uh, as well. Uh, well, um, as you may know or not, um, our public TV and radio uh, has a history of political influences uh, since the beginning when we had Vladimir Mecher as the prime minister. Uh, and then it continued all, all the way in, the, in a less brutal way. Um, five years ago, we uh, somehow managed to get a director that was quite successful. He was the only one that actually uh, 
endured the whole term, the only CEO in the history that lasted five years now. And f in these five years, uh, we somehow managed to double the audience of the public TV in Slovakia and to come from the bottom of the credibility of TV news to the, to the top, um, which is a great success, but uh, we still have some challenges we face. Uh, we will have the elections of the director in one month in, at the end of the June, and uh, we still don't know what will be going on in our TV and radio, and uh, the new director will start at the 1st of August, so we are quite curious what will happen in, in the TV. That is what you uh, mentioned about Hungary and Poland. We, I mean, we are not in that bad situation, but still, if we see Hungary and Poland and how fast it can change, um, uh, we are still very cautious about it, and we still don't know what will happen quite soon in Slovakia. Uh, the reason why I think we gained so much credibility and we doubled the audience is that people in Slovakia are a bit tired uh, of the infotainment that is going on in the co commercial TVs, uh, which our numbers shows as well, because every time we uh, broadcast some kind of uh, crime news, uh, the audience goes down for, for the report, actually. So uh, people somehow in Slovakia got a little bit tired of that. And the other reason is that we do more serious news, um, more foreign news, uh, the commercial TVs, don't do any any serious foreign news about the, the important things that are going on in Europe, so maybe that's the thing as well. And um, we still do a lot of mistakes. We have a very young team. That's the main problem. It was very hard to uh, persuade the experienced journalists to come and to believe in the, in the project because of the history of the political influence and the instability, so uh, I'm 20, I will be soon 29, and I'm one of uh, the most experienced reporters there, so that's not a normal situation, of course. Um, so we have a very young team, uh, and uh, we, I think we face different challenges that the BBC or ORF, because you have uh, a different history and uh, you are more established in your countries, so that's a bit different, I guess. Thank you very much, Susanna. I'm sure people are already having questions, but we will move on in this round and we'll move actually uh, to the mother of all, <laughs> and that's the BBC. With us is Ken McQuarrie. Um, Ken has uh, such a long track record at the BBC in different functions, and he's just recently changed again. Uh, so he'll say something on that himself as to the new functions he will take up. And um, I would like to express my gratitude here as we are in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, the German public service media was after the Second World War modeled um, using the BBC as, as our role model and uh, I would just say that uh, we still benefit a lot from that and in at the Council of Europe uh, we also always go to BBC News if we are looking to a trustworthy source. Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, just to say a little bit about myself, I'm Director of Nations and Regions for the BBC, which means I'm responsible for the uh, BBC, the performance of the BBC's output outside London, but also for the outputs that come from outside London and a member of the, the BBC board. Um, I think the challenge for public service broadcasters at the moment is, fair, is fundamentally a fairly straightforward one. It's right now that the competition is more intense than at any time in our media history. It's a competition that not just from the conventional media sources, but also from the new media. I guess that broadcasters and newspapers have long been rivals for the attention of those seeking knowledge, but the growth of television itself has led to the advent of channels such as Fox and other channels with an identity which is sometimes defined by their philosophy or their agenda, uh, which is something that's particular to themselves. And meantime, the internet has become a major 
factor in the consumption of news. More and more people rely on online sources for their information around the world. And some of this comes from what we might accept to be traditional journalism, whether that's the New York Times, uh, the BBC, uh, and many of these institutions run comprehensive and successful online operations in their own right or via the third party platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, uh, etc. But then there are recent arrivals like BuzzFeed, uh, the Huffington Post, and still arguably operating to a large extent within the traditional um, journalism. But beyond that, that we then have, and I think the, the kind of when you have, um, I think, uh, binary contests, you know, such as the referenda that we had in the UK, you tend to see this springing up. You get, uh, I think, publications that promote their own view of the world, and there are then social media providers that are not only platforms in their own right, but increasingly content providers. What are the sources in their own right? That's a debate that's going on at the moment. It's still to be resolved, to my mind. But I think finally, and this was a phenomenon that we've seen recently in the UK, friends and family are often the most trusted sources of information for individuals in, in society. Um, and there's the straightforward exchange of information between users uh, in a social media sense, posting, sharing with others, and in many cases that content being shared comes from the sources I've already mentioned. But the important thing is it's selective sharing and it's often consumed selectively. Social media can be, I think, a means of receiving a diverse range of information, of learning new and challenging things, but it can also be an environment that lacks diversity, the classic, um, I think, somewhat cliched term now, the echo chambers, where you w learn what you wish to learn and see only what you wish to see. But social media is not the only echo chamber. Traditional media have long prided themselves on knowing their audience, knowing what they like, not just in content itself, but in tone. And I think that too often the traditional media assume knowledge. They deliver information in ways that engage um, the already informed, but fail to reach those who seek knowledge in a different way um, for whom they're looking for content that is more relevant. And they also ignore the large section of the population who do not consume any news media or information whatsoever, who choose to have zero information uh, given to them. I think that collectively, PSBs have a problem in accessing the young. The young themselves have no issue in accessing information from places and in ways that suit them. But for me, age is a direct differentiating factor and uh, more important than social demographics for the traditional media. And in reaching the young, not just today, but in the future, the key will be relevance, and it ultimately will be the key to the survival of the PSBs. So these are the challenges as I see them. What about the responses? I think it would be too easy for the PSBs to rush into the social media universe to adopt the techniques of the broadcast platforms, the philosophy, the language, and the techniques of social media and by definition their values. Because for, for me, values matter. They are the quality by which organizations such as the BBC and other PSBs are judged. They're the fundamental, the fundamental values that underpin the editorial work of the BBC leads to trust. It leads to a commitment to impartiality, to fairness, to independence, and a fearless promotion of the public interest. To abandon or subvert these values in the pursuit of an elusive audience would undermine the reputation and any gains would be outstripped by a loss of faith, a loss of confidence, a loss of trust in the things that make the BBC uh, the respected in many countries and to many peoples. So, Success in this diverse world is, on the contrary, a question of finding ways to adapt, but not to compromise. I'm optimistic 
that the audience, whether current or future, is fundamentally intelligent and curious. The key to reaching them and retaining them is to complement that intelligence and satisfy that curiosity in ways that are relevant to them, whilst at the same time staying true to what is important to us. We come from an age where the role of public service media has largely accepted, been accepted across all sections of society. Research by the BBC Trust in 2015 established that the broadcasters, the BBC in particular, are still the most trusted providers of news. And that social media, for all their engagement and diversity, are a long way behind. But it isn't enough for the BBC to live off past reputations or merely to reiterate values without an articulation of how these values should be applied. And the answer to the challenges I've outlined are elusive, and I don't think the solutions are easy. But the range of different choices means that to survive, we must not only deliver our content, but we must champion the values of that content. And in order to do that, I think we have to skill ourselves in that regard. Because we may be skilled in delivering the content, but I do not believe that the traditional broadcasters are skilled in articulating the case for public service media. And Jean-Paul, my colleague, and his, his colleagues have identified this and have a particularly rich resource to help public service broadcasters articulate and make that case. So the job is not just about the content, not just about the values, it's about articulating the case for public service media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, very rich, a lot of food for thought, and yes, how to transport the values, that seems to be key here, and reaching out to the younger audience. Can public service media uh, play a crucial role? We will see now with Konrad Mitschka, uh, I could say the in-between, uh, as he is from the ORF, the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, and there he um, is part of the Public Value Department. The Public Value Department, Konrad is responsible, and I've seen he has a few more copies, if you are fast enough, but don't run away now, uh, has published a report. And I'm very curious, I haven't looked into it yet, but I see already uh, it must be very healthy because we have a cucumber and a banana. So let's see what's inside. And now let's see what Conrad wants to say about, about public values. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. You see, what, what I'd like to say, I'd, I'd like to start with um, a feeling. When I see other Austrians, uh, you know, if, if you don't know Austria, it's a small country and I feel it's a very rich country. Yeah. seventh richest country in the world. But when I see, not as far as Switzerland, yeah, but we don't have so much black money, maybe that's, that's the reason why. When I, when, we, when I see them, when I talk to them, it's always the, sa the same, they feel insecure. You know what? They are sitting in front of their own house, in front of their two cars, and they just are afraid of the future to come. And Maybe because I'm an Austrian myself, even though I have only one car and no house, uh, um, I understand them because of all these disruptive developments we saw. We saw our core values and beliefs, or at least some of them, being shaken. Just think about the financial crisis and what we did to Greece and think about European solidarity, uh, which we at least as far as I understood it, not offered as much as we had could. Just think about the so-called refugee crisis and what it did to our understanding of diversity. I think some of our democratic institutions are doubted and are attacked. Just think about Brexit or at least Donald Trump. Um, let me mention the rise of populism and nationalism. 
And of course, the landscape of communications, it changed radically. You mentioned the number of social media, same in Austria, more and more young people rely on news being brought on social media, and we have a special situation. Public service media is not allowed to be there in my home country, so it's difficult to reach younger people. We are very strongly restricted. And we have some other facts concerning the media world. The big five, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, their revenue is 11 times bigger than the revenue of each public service, of all the public service media. So if you compare 63 public service media in Europe and only the big five, it's 1 to 11. Yeah. I mentioned that because Sylvia, when the micros wear off, she, she said something like, well, you're in a strong position. I mean, I don't feel strong if the other ones are 11 times bigger than me. You know what I mean? Um, if we would compare ourselves to the 10 biggest commercial companies in Europe, only European ones, their revenues are twice as large as ours. So if you compare 10 to 63, it's 2 to 1. So I think the landscape has strong players, and that's what I'd call a disruptive change if I compare it to my own uh, past. When I was young, okay, uh, living a li little bit longer on this planet than you, uh, uh, 19 years longer, it was public service media to be strong. Now it's Apple, now it's Samsung, now it's Rupert Murdoch, maybe. On the other hand, uh, if I compare these disruptive uh, changes, I feel that democracy is nothing um, that is of immediate effect or that needs immediate effects. It needs sustainability, it's need, it needs day-by-day -day work, so it needs, and so I come back to that, what you said, Jean-Philippe, because you mentioned the values of the EBU, and compared some of them with news, and I would say the value most needed by news is, at least as far as I see it, accountability. The, that I know when I get up in the morning, the world still stands. And I, I have something where I can, um, a news, uh, news I can trust every morning. It's not in crisis. It's not when the bomb explodes, it, it's not when again a terrorist shakes us, it's just the day-by-day -day news. And I think one of the backbones of sustainability, the one in media is public service media. Okay, we are still under pressure, I know. Yeah. Switzerland next year there will be a referendum and maybe there won't be any public service media in Switzerland after next year. They closed Israel down this year. Just, I would like to remind you of Greece. They closed it down five years ago, okay. Then there were re-elections and they reopened it. Maybe <clears throat> uh, it's bad news from Slovakia, if you heard right now. Maybe in Austria we'll get a new government which will shake us again. Yeah, now we are still happy, same situation maybe, yeah, happy situation with uh, very free journalists, but it could change. So, yeah, we are under attack and I think that forces us yeah, to react and one of the reactions we set and we have to set is to build bridges to the audience again, to enable them to understand and to help democracy. Enabling is, I think, something you put on the agenda, the BBC, and I think we have to be and to become more responsive, to talk with the people, to show us, to talk about us, to show them what we are doing, why we are doing it, to show them our values, and because I believe that this kind of discourse, this kind of debating public service media and its purposes and its 
um, values and its needs is why I'm so happy that I'm here and why I want to stop right now because talking means listening as well and so I'm very curious what you are going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad. Now it's your time. Um, I see already a lady in yellow there for the... And let me just ask you, do you also and in hear pink. me without the microphone? Yeah. So I would not need it. And if you, you like it or... If you, Thank if you. you could briefly introduce yourself. Um, Yara Bader from Syria. I work with Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression and proudly new member of IBI. I have two points uh, if you can help me to understand. The first one, general, and it, it also related to yesterday talking about uh, fake news, which uh, the discussion take a very uh, direction to focus on tourism and um, then the Islamic tourism, which is a fact, but like, uh, um, as a, as a, from an ethic viewpoint, do you think, uh, how, how, how do you describe or why you don't use the words related to the uh, government tourism? And if you did, would you prefer to mention it as a state uh, tourism, government tourism, or uh, regime tourism? Um, and uh, as well, for, for example, uh, what the cartel do to, to journalism in uh, journalists in, in Mexico, would you accept, uh, describe this uh, as a tourism too? Because I'm a little bit afraid there that uh, by our daily work we are uh, confessing a stereotype photo about tourism is just Islam, and it could be more uh, or uh, and more dangerous than this uh, definition. Um, my second question it's specific to Mr. Kane from BBC because you know I'm from Syria and uh, BBC is a dream for ethics and journalism, but unfortunately in 2011 and after the situation in Syria, um, I, I will speak about the Arabic desk, if, if you can uh, help me. Uh, we had so many um, questions about the uh, editor-chief uh, policy. So uh, when, when uh, Mufti of Syria killed in um, April 2013, for example, uh, BBC Arabic uh, put uh, the first video which related to assass assassination, and she said, we cannot confirm this video. And uh, a few hours later, a new video came to mention that uh, it, he wasn't killed in uh, explosion, he was killed by, by shot, and BBC didn't put the second video. So why? BBC always uh, preferred to Arabic. They preferred to use, we couldn't confirm this video, but there's uh, at least 10 organizations are working on checking uh, videos and images uh, came from Syria. There's one called Czech. <laughs> There's uh, more than two or three Syrians. Uh, or why you don't cooperate with them? BBC Arabic Desk. Uh, BBC uh, uh, reporter in Damascus uh, take a photo laughing with the Syrian army uh, while Aleppo sag. Do you think this is professional from ethic viewpoint? Um, a lot of questions about BBC Arabic Desk. If you can help us to understand how things are going there. Thank you. Um, probably, as these were already two quite long questions, we see, would you like Ken to respond first? To, to, to the second one, yes. I think the, in terms of establishing, you know, the, the, if you like, the, what, what is accurate and what is not, you know, that, it's a never-ending process in journalism. In the BBC, we prefer uh, not to outsource that at the moment to try and rely with our, with our own experts. How good or bad that may be, you can judge. Um, the, what I think that in the development and the publication of any service, the, the commitment we make is for an absolute openness you know, to, to the challenge you know, from when we get things wrong. And, that, and the B, BBC Arabic, it's absolutely a BBC service like any other service in terms of the challenge which it's responsible to, first of all, the board in terms of its accuracy and also to the regulation by, under the new charter by Ofcom. So wh wherever there are specific, I'm reluctant to, on these specific issues because I don't know the facts, you know, and so 
uh, being a, a decent journalist, I would prefer to have the facts before de responding you know, to, your, to your question. Uh, the only thing I would say that, that I agree with what Edward Lucas said yesterday from The Economist, that the whole process uh, you know, of selecting facts, selecting material, is something that has to be transparent for, the, for all of the broadcasters to be absolutely transparent as where they're, where they're selecting material, with one exception, with the need to protect sources, where there are sources who are giving information who will be endangered by virtue of making public what the, what the source is. But as a principle, uh, I think the transparency about the source and the transparency about that editorial process is the only way that journalism can proceed. And I, I think that uh, Edward Lucas said, truth is a process. The very fact of any, whenever you make, um, whenever you, uh, I'm slightly nervous about, what, about the term fake news, because I think it's being used in so many different contexts. It, it is, I'm uneasy, I'm becoming uneasy about using it at all as a term. But, the, but what I do think is demonstrable is that when you're involved in the business of journalism, first of all, the very selection of facts you know, is, a, is a judgment. And I think that providing that you are transparent as to how you reach the selection of the facts and, you're open and that you suspend judgment throughout the, throughout the period, that is the best that we can do. I do also believe that in terms of the language that we engage with each other is as important as the, as the process. And my col former colleague and boss, Mark Thompson, I think wrote an excellent book on that recently. You know, it's now, now chief executive of the New York Times about the need for us, for the tone of the dialogue to be important. I'm not sure if it answers your question, but I think what I, what I would say is that in, if you have any issue with the output, the answer to that is in the openness of our process and our response to that. Thank you, Ken. I would like to see with my other panelists whether they'd like to come on on that as, as a general problem of uh, also in view of uh, yeah, social media bringing in unfiltered and unchecked information, there's certainly a higher stress level on public service media, but also um, a need for public service media to be really diligent. I wonder whether you have some observations on that? Perhaps one comment. I think that it's, it's very important that the skills in the newsroom have, have, have to change. Uh, we need to train more and more people how to deal with the multiple sources that are out there. Uh, some of them that are very relevant because they contribute to reporting on, on, on the news. Um, so what happens at the EBU is, is that we have uh, specific training skills now in the EBU newsroom where people, are, um, in the case of breaking news, try and find other sources uh, than the uh, traditional ones that often come in a lot later and then clear that content. We, today we, we clear about 20 um, content uh, contributions uh, a day, which is, uh, which is a lot. But it's not only the EBU that does this. I see that all um, individual newsrooms or national newsrooms as well, you know, uh, start working on these skills and start to train people. And we have an international network with the EBU and all of these uh, people who uh, um, exchange existing tools on how to uh, better check uh, upon uh, the facts that are offered on uh, uh, social uh, media. After you. Uh, I don't know if I can, I, I will speak uh, my opinion, uh, what was happening in Slovakia during the, the migrant crisis and what was happening in my TV and what I think was a mistake that we reported um, many minor incidents, for example, in Germany, uh, whenever there was an attack in a train with a knife or something like that. And we didn't really even know what was that at the time. We reported it with a short uh, 
brief news that, that happened in Germany, and that was uh, helping the, um, the, to, to increase the fear in the country, I guess, and that was a mistake. Um, we evaluated it somehow, and we changed the policy, but we did face these, these challenges when the migrant crisis started. Okay, first of all, to your question, I'd like to mention, I hope that we will be sustainable enough to be courageous enough to be slow. I mean, speed kills, you know what I mean? And I, I, I'm not sure if I understood your first question, but if you ask us or me too if, about terrorism or what I would call terrorism, Believe me, I don't like people placing bombs anywhere, be them Muslims, be them Hindus, be them Christians, be them Mexicans, don't know. Yeah? Of course, we would, in Austria, report about Mexico not so intensively because it's so far, far, far away. Yeah? Always the same, you're reporting more about yourself, more about your neighbors. So for us, it's more interesting what's happening in Europe than in Mexico, but still, we are doing it. Did, did you want to talk about that, or didn't I get you right? But why in news we cannot see uh, some action? Like, what happened in journalism? Because it's not the journalism referred to as a tourist, or when government do huge human rights violation, why is that come up? Referred to as a government terrorism and if you as a as a chief editor decided to go in this way especially for the government which form ethically you would think it's it's good which expression it should be the one we use the government terrorism the regime terrorism the state terrorism i i'm just uh, interested because i think what we are doing is we are confessing a stereotype image that terrorism it's just like this and that's very dangerous, as it is very dangerous to not raise awareness about like what's happening in Mexico, because next day it could happen to us. I, I, I agree in some way with you, but I'm not the editor-in-chief, and I'm happy to live in a country where the editor-in-chief doesn't listen to me when I suggest that he only would, should use a single word for something, you know? But, no. uh, I should like to move on. I'm, I just wanted to say to every assembled that I've been asked to join the, the IPI board meeting to elect the new chair, so I have to give my apologies in that regard. Yeah. And I would briefly just say in conclusion that some of the issues that we're wrestling with here are, no, are not new, particularly to historians such as Mark Bloch, whose marvelous book, The Historian's Craft, you know, sums up you know, the difficulties with source material. And that if there is anybody in the room who, for and on Syria, for example, the Arabic service, that you want to approach me during the course of the day with more detail, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you for having been with us, and we uh, release you to your other very important function because it's important also to strengthen the IPI at all fronts. So Ken is doing that now. Um, can I, yes, please, more questions from the audience, sure. please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rita. I'm uh, Rita Pihlemäki from uh, YLE, Finnish broadcasting company. Um, in this panel, it has been mentioned, obviously, and um, I understand that perfectly, that um, uh, trust being uh, the most trusted source of information is the, the key question of the public service media. But then I heard um, Jan Helene from the SVT, Swedish um, public broadcaster, uh, the program director. He said something uh, like um, that we as, um, as journalists, our first thing is to reach for truth. That's the, the, the biggest thing. And then uh, in, in, in this, um, uh, while reaching the truth, we, we might lose some of our trust. So how do you see, is it, uh, could there be a truth or trust? Is there, um, what, what kind of question is, is that for you? Uh, 
Well, I can talk about my experience. Uh, in Slovakia, we have um, a huge community of uh, poor Roma people living in horrible, horrible conditions. And the intensity between the majority and Romas um, uh, is very high. And people tend to have racist comments about Romas and so on. And I do cover a lot of uh, Roma stories. And when I started five or six years ago, um, uh, actually the, the commercial TVs weren't covering these stories at all and the reason why was because people switch the channel when they see stories about Romas that are not crime stories, that they are stealing and parasiting on, on, the, on, the, on the society. Uh, but we did cover a lot of these stories and uh, in five years we've, although it was very unpopular, we've uh, achieved that these stories are the most shared on our Facebook and they reach a lot of uh, viewers and it somehow changed. But I did receive a lot of uh, letters, mails uh, that were um, not very pleasant um, about uh, protecting uh, Romas and their rights and uh, I mean people are very angry about them uh, for several reasons but the main reason is they are poor and with the, the, the poor people there are com coming different uh, problems. And we did uh, somehow manage to, to, although it was unpopular, to c continue with that and uh, it changed somehow. So this is my experience. I don't know if I answered your question but uh, we did manage that and, and now it's not so unpopular and I can see that other, other media are covering more these stories because uh, they somehow noticed. If, if I may add, I think you have to make a distinction in between facts and truth. Facts are facts and there's no doubt about uh, uh, a fact. A truth can depend, I think, on who you are and what the context is. And what we often forget is that when we produce news, distribute news, it comes to a person in, in an individual way. And we were discussing the um, migration crisis. Already using the word migration means that you make a choice to move from one country to another. If you say it's the refugee crisis, then you, this is about people who flee um, a war zone and try to get comfort somewhere, somewhere else. Already this is a, an important fact. And I think that um, where we sometimes make a mistake in truth, specifically in this re refugee crisis, when Merkel said, you know, we're shuffling us, one million uh, uh, refugees, we can find a home for them. Um, there she took a very human and a liberal point of view, which is very good, which is some sort of truth. But the other truth which was not reported about is that we're shuffling us, uh, what is said by, by the president, um, or the Bundeskanzler is, is different than for the people who live in a town who see a school being taken over by, by the, these refugees. This is also some sort of, uh, of, uh, of truth. And I think that um, uh, good journalism should cover all of these, uh, uh, should cover the facts and all of these, uh, these truths. And I think there is, a, uh, because we live in a, f in a fast world, and I fully agree with uh, Conrad, uh, a fast world means that reporting happens now, immediately, in 140 characters. We need to have more slow, because slow is the new fast. And I think that the answer to a lot of the challenges that we have been debating here is contextualizing things again. Provide the context of what is happening. Go to in-depth journalism, you know, in, in ways that are understandable for uh, all of the uh, audiences. And, and I'm happy to see that there is a... Um, we always say investigative journalism is expensive and uh, we don't have the resources that we clearly feel a need as well to invest much more in, 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 in this uh, investigative uh, journalism. Okay. <laughs> I'm always the man in between talking, the la talking and as last. <laughs> um, yes, I think we are committed to the truth. Thank you for the distinction between facts and opinion somehow, so we are committed to facts which are true and we are committed somehow, as I see, to the gifts uh, that enlightenment gave us. So,
to enable the discourse that I think our task as public service media um, to enable a discourse where the better proof, where the better argument should win. Um, so it's not only a commitment to truth, uh, but to discourse again. And I think if um, losing trust is the problem, then responsiveness and becoming more responsive is the solution. Thank you very much. Um, another question from the audience, please. Um, I'll hold up it. It's because of the recording. Yeah. Okay. Martin Huckabee, uh, editorial consultant from London. It's a question for Susanna Hanselova. Um, you've been, after a very difficult legacy over the past five years, you've been building audiences and promoting values. Um, you're now coming to an election or perhaps an appointment of a new director. What can the staff and management do to fight for for what you've achieved and make sure that you can continue that in the next five? I, I feel pretty nothing. <laughs> That's the saddest thing. Uh, uh, well, we have now, uh, the process is at the end, we have 12 candidates for the director. And the, the main thing that disturbs me is that the, there is not a debate about how to improve the, the, the public Slovak TV. Uh, there are only these discussion between politicians uh, handling, you know, the situation, and there is no public debate about public service and public TV at all. And uh, there will be a public hearing of the candidates uh, in the parliament. Uh, I think next week, if I'm not wrong. But um, I would love to be in a country where the, well, where the candidates would put on the table their plan with the public TV and then it would be like um, that in, in five years they would be responsible for that plan of course and that is not happening in our country. Uh, we are lucky to have um, the other journalists on our sides from the, the other media. Uh, I mean if it goes really wrong I'm prepared to protest and to leave. Uh, but I'm not sure if uh, I'm not sure how many colleagues would join me in this fight. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, that I, I think that this is the only way to fight for fight to to protest and to leave if anything bad happens, which is not good for the TV, of course. If everyone leaves, no one stays. That's not a good good situation. Thank you. Well, that's tough reality. We will look to the developments in Slovakia closely. I think I can say that personally. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the joint declaration on freedom of expression and fake news, in adverted commas, disinformation and propaganda. That joint declaration is available online. Google will help you finding it. Uh, this is a declaration made in March by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion and the OSCE uh, Media Freedom um, Representative, as well as the representative of the uh, Organization of American States and the African Commission on Human Rights and People's Rights, and that is the shortened title. So uh, apologies, it's not a very marketable title. Uh, why do I mention this joint declaration? Because you are uh, an international congress, uh, and in this very rich and elaborate joint declaration, there is a lot of differentiation as to what is misinformation, disinformation, and what is propaganda. And so the fake news term uh, comes in and it has, I don't know, many, many shades of gray, let's say. So should you like to have some more concrete um, opinion on that, uh, look, look into this joint declaration. And especially for journalists and media outlets, there is a point five where I just want to briefly highlight the call for self-regulation, the striving for accuracy, and the need for critical 
coverage as that is in the public interest. So um, we are almost at lunchtime. I don't want to stand between you and the lunch. Um, I see with my panelists, if they want to come in on something last, if that is not the case, I would like to take up what Ken said, namely how important it is to transport the values. And I think in this discussion we've come a bit closer to a solution and that is it's upon you as journalists to provide the context. The context is key. You have to explain to the audience that is curious and that is willing to listen, I think. You have to provide the context and probably there you have to also use social media as your means of transport. But you are essential for the context. Thank you very much.